Welcome. It is a beautiful morning here in the state of Kentucky. I hope that it is a beautiful morning wherever you are. Uh, regardless of the weather externally, the Lord is good. And we want to rejoice and celebrate in Him today. We are going to be in Psalm 11. We're going to look at verses 4 and 5 in our few moments together to, uh, this morning. Uh, before we get into that, as always, let us ask the Lord for help in prayer. Let's pray. We do, Lord, seek your face. We delight ourselves in you. We recognize that there is no life, no joy, no hope apart from you. Would you speak, Lord? Speak by the Spirit through your word to our minds and hearts to teach us and to guide us to live joyfully for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 11, we're going to look at verses 4 and 5. We looked at verses 1, 2, and 3 yesterday. And, and today, as we get into the passage, hear the word of God. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. We see over and over again, and maybe you will recognize a repeated theme about God dealing with wrong. And God deals with wrong out there, and God deals with wrong in here. God is the one who deals with wrong, with error, with wickedness with sin and we see here the fact that God is not aloof or clueless or indifferent we see the place and position of God's sovereign and God's righteous authority verse 14 the Lord is in his holy temple and this is not an earthly temple this isn't Solomon's temple. This isn't the temple that was built later. This is not the temple that was around in the time of Jesus. David recognizing here that this God does not dwell in houses made with human hands. God is in his heavenly temple. Wherever that is, God is there. And it is greater than our creation, our world, our universe, because our universe is a creation of God not the very manifestation of God himself. God's in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. We have that here then. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. God, as I said, is not aloof. Nothing is hidden from his sight. Sight here, seeing means God is fully aware of what is going on in the world, in our homes, in our places of business, in our country, and in our own hearts and minds. God knows, and this is, this is terrifying to recognize that God knows every secret thought and attention of our heart. God knows us comprehensively far better than even we know ourselves. Nothing is hidden from his sight. God sees, and his eyelids test. It's kind of like, you know, I don't know if you can tell, but you squint a little bit, and you scrutinize, you evaluate, you... You look, your, your eyelids are very expressive. And, and here we have David using anthropomorphic imagery and language to describe God's vision, ability to see, and God's scrutinizing, God's evaluating process. God is in the process of doing that for each of us. But then in verse 5, we have a distinction made. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked. Now, what we need to understand here is God only sees two categories of people, those that are in Christ and those that are not in Christ. And so this is not a statement on race or ethnicity or country of origin or skin color or language. As a matter of fact, verse 5, the implication here, the righteous and the wicked, David is being um, prompted to describe not Jew-Gentile, 
Jew being righteous, Gentile being wicked, David's actually being moved to uh, expose the reality that within God's own camp, the Hebrew people, there are those that are righteous and those that are wicked, those that are uh, honest and genuine in their trust in God and those that are not. God is evaluating his own house in a sense. You know, Calvin talks about how there is the invisible church and the visible church. That within the body of Christ, within every local church, there are those that really still get the, that do get the gospel and those that still struggle to get the gospel that don't really get it yet. Those in whom the Holy Spirit has not taken up residency and the, the blood of Jesus and the broken body of Christ and his sacrifice on the cross and the victory in his resurrection is not their lived reality. David is saying here, the Lord tests the righteous. Testing means uh, prove. God uh, evaluates to such a degree to reveal that we truly are, in fact, those that trust Jesus are, in fact, God's people. But the soul, his soul hates the wicked, the one who does violence. So there's the proving of the righteous. There's the punishing, punishing of the wicked. This is the work and the will and the way of God. It may not fall upon our ears in our contemporary day thinking, oh, what, what an archaic idea of God. Maybe the archaic idea of God is not the problem. Maybe it is because we have forfeited the historic truth about who God is with an arrogant idea that somehow we are far more advanced, evolved, and learned that we know better when in fact our learning has actually made us dumber and less faithful and less true to God. Friends, the Lord reigns. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is upon his throne in heaven. And God longs to reign and rule in not just the creation in total, in concept, but God longs to take up residency and sit upon the throne of each of our hearts and take the lead and that we would humbly and graciously and joyfully follow his lead. Let us be those who trust Christ, lay down our lives, surrender to Jesus, and thereby let God take the lead. Let's pray. Father, help us because we don't want to give up this control. We don't want to give up this uh, power and this responsibility easily. Pry it from our hands loosen it from our hearts, Lord, that we would humbly trust, surrender, and depend upon you and allow you, God, to take the lead in our life today and every day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, may the Lord take your lead, take the lead in your life and in my life. I'll see you tomorrow.